Okay, Chairperson Blois, we are ready to go. Okay, thank you. Welcome to the Carmichael Old Foothill Farms CPAC. I am Chairman Nick Blois. Um, uh, Dorel, the Clerk of the Board, would you please call the roll and establish a quorum and then please read the announcement. Yes. Member Burnett? <laughs> Member Jax Comroy? Here. Member Luis Feliciano? That's Michael Feliciano. Luis is my middle name. Sorry. I'm here. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, you know what? We usually call by the last name. So I'll just say Feliciano. So I apologize about that. Um, no Member problem. McC no worries. Member mm -hmm. McCoy? Uh, present. Member Rockenstein? Here. Member Rosales? And Member Boyce? Here. And you have a quorum. Okay, and now on to you're welcome and now on to my announcements in compliance with directives of the county state and centers for disease mm -hmm. control and prevention this meeting is live streamed and closed to in-person public participation temporary procedures are subject to change pursuant to guidelines related to social distancing and minimizing person-to-person -person contact mm -hmm. to make a verbal comment at today's meeting dial 916-875-2500 and follow the prompts to be placed in queue for a specific agenda item or off agenda matter. When the chair opens public comment for a specific agenda item or off agenda matter, callers mm -hmm. will be transferred from the queue into the meeting to make a verbal comment. Mm -hmm. Written comments are also accepted. Send your email comment to board clerk at satcounty.net. Your comment will be routed to the board and filed into the record. And also, um, I want to make note that if there's anyone on the line that is simply calling in support of an of an item and not to do a presentation, they do need to hang up and call the verbal comment line, which is 916-875-2500. You will not be able to make your public comment on the line through BlueJeans. You need to call in to our public comment line. Also, since we have a couple of new members, I just want to go over quickly how to make a motion if you choose to make a motion during the meeting. First, you want to make sure that you, when you make your motion, that you make it an affirmative. So you want to say, um, I would like to move the motion to approve um, a staff recommendation, or you can um, say, however it's stated on the actual item, you can say to approve a design review or approve um, um, a, like a tentative partial map that way. Or you can ask to deny. You can say, I would like to move to deny a tentative partial map. Also, you're going to need, once you make that motion, you're going to need a second. And if there is no second, then that motion dies. Also, um, let's see here. If for some reason you feel that you cannot if you have a conflict with making a, a, a motion for a particular item, if you need to recuse yourself, you need to um, make sure that you make it known that you have a conflict with the item and you need to leave the, the room, which would actually be leaving the this um, virtual meeting. And then once the item is over, we can contact you and let you come back into the meeting. And if you just are unfamiliar with the item and you need more information and you don't feel comfortable um, voting, then you can just abstain from the um, from the uh, item, but you can stay in the room. Um, also um, available, you can um, make a friendly amendment to a motion that's already been made, and that has to be and that has to be voted on before the main motion. And if anyone has any questions about that, I'm here to answer that. And that concludes my announcements. Can I ask a question? This is Michael Feliciano. Yes. Thank you. And I am a new member. This is my first meeting of the CPAC. Um, I, <clears throat> I heard you describing the process if we um, were looking at an item and wanted to like, make a motion to decline, let's say, um, you, you know, like in, in the case of today, like we have 
um, some items being considered by the CPAC. What I was told coming into this though is that all we we're able to do as a group is make recommendations. So making a motion would be like, I'm going to make a motion that we recommend to decline this this modification or, or something like that. Am I correct in understanding yes. your directions? Yes. So you can, in, for instance, you can make a motion to recommend approval of a project or okay. you can say of staff recommendations, um, that kind yeah. of thing. You cannot make any conditions or anything to that motion. So you can't say, oh, I move to approve um, this project if they um, do, you know, a certain thing, if they improve parking or drainage or whatever. No, you cannot do that. But you can make a mo motion to approve a recommendation, yes. Thank you, that's, that's what I understood. Sounds like a great. Are there any other questions? And that concludes my announcement. Okay, thank you, Jarrell. All right, um, this is uh, Chairman Boyce. Um, just real quick, I want to go over some uh, meeting procedures and best practices um, for all those in attendance. Um, speak from the handset or your headset. Um, please mute devices when not speaking to minimize background noise. Announce your name when speaking on an agenda item so all participants and listeners are aware who has the floor. When the chair calls for a motion in a second, announce your name prior to making the motion or second. Um, and the clerk will take a voice vote and confirmation of the results of the vote. So um, with that, um, would the clerk please call the first item? Yes. Item number one is going to be 6815 Stanley Avenue Pool House and Garage Special Development Permit located at 6815 Stanley Avenue in the Carmichael Creek neighborhood preservation area of the Carmichael community. Request for a special development permit and design review. Good evening, members of the CPAC. This is David Mulberry. Uh, the project planner for the 6815 Stanley Avenue Garage and Pool House uh, Special Development Permit Project. Next slide, please. The project is located at 6815 Stanley Avenue in the Carmichael Creek neighborhood preservation area of the Carmichael community. And the request for a special development permit to allow a pool house greater than 500 feet and exceed the 16 foot maximum height for accessory structures, as well as a design review to determine consistency with the countywide design guidelines. Next slide, please. So existing conditions, uh, the existing primary residence was constructed in 1984 with renovations um, and an addition completed in 2018. The area for the proposed pool house is currently vacant. And there we have the existing house uh, proposed site. Next slide, please. Here we have a zoomed in site plan and then an overall site plan. Um, it is important to note that uh, they are providing a 12 and a half foot uh, setback on the side property line uh, per the side street uh, setbacks. And they are meeting all required setbacks. Next slide, please. Uh, here is the floor plan. So on the first floor, they would have the uh, garage. And then um, upstairs, they would have um, their, their pool room and media room. Uh, it's also important to note that a, a, kin a kitchen is not proposed with this. Next slide, please. Here we have the elevations. Uh, they're proposing to match the colors and materials of the primary residence. Next slide, please. And here are the left and right elevations. And it is important to note that there is a grade variation um, between the pool and the, uh, the proposed uh, site, um, so that's why you're seeing that 
entryway kind of elevated right there. Next slide, please. Key points, uh, staff has worked with the applicant to meet the side street setback standard and maintain the intent of the Carmichael Creek MPA with the increased side yard setback. Uh, the proposal meets all setbacks and all development standards aside from the accessory structure height and the pool house square footage. The colors, materials, and architectural style proposed match the primary residence. And the final approval body is the zoning administrator. Um, I also will note that uh, this has been reviewed by uh, Metro Fire, and they have determined, due to it not being considered an accessory dwelling unit, that uh, they would not require the uh, existing access easement to be widened. Uh, next slide, please. And so with that, that concludes my presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. The applicant is also in attendance. I have a question for you, David. What was your last name again? I'm sorry. It's Ulri. O U L. Thank you. I think, you, I think we emailed earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your presentation. I, and I, I see that that uh, the items that you just listed. If we can go back to that last slide where it um, it lists. Uh, thank you. Um, consistent item number three. There consistent with provisions of Carmichael Creek. Um, neighborhood Association. I read a considerable amount of um, public comment, in, including uh, multiple comments from the Carmichael Creek Neighborhood Association, um, as well as a few of the neighbors in that local area that expressing um, opposition to this, uh, the, the variation being granted. Um, and, do I understand that the note here, number three, consistent with the provisions of the Carmichael Creek Neighborhood Association, does this mean that they've changed the, that comment and that they are uh, in, a, in support of this project now? No, so this is um, based on our review of the NPA and it, it gives, um, uh, it's fairly um, consistent with just our general zoning, the NPA. And the provision that was cited in the neighbor uh, comments, um, that is stating that the uh, proposed uses would be consistent with what is uh, allowed per the underlying zoning for uses specifically. Um, so of course they're still subject to the uh, the special development permit process as would be required by the the RD5 zoning, so. Thank so you. It's not, so, it's not specifically um, prescribing development standards in that NPA. Okay. And so there were no conflicts identified between um, the NPA and that right. project. Right. So, so, so <clears throat> consistent with the provisions, in a general broad sense, but not including the variation that's being requested is the way I understand that you're describing it. And so because the specific uh, opposition to, to the like the height uh, proposed by the in the variation of 22 feet, as well as the, the larger space um, seems to be, you know, it, with the fire access piece, it sounds like is resolved, but but even on based on that uh, concern expressed about the, um, the the height and how it intrudes upon the the local landscape of the area the the, the it sounds like that's still um, contrary to the preference of the uh, Carmichael Creek Neighborhood Association correct right I mean so. The, the Carmichael Creek Neighborhood uh, Preservation Area Ordinance and the Carmichael Creek uh, Community Association are two separate um, things. So um, I just would would clarify that uh, this is referring back to our standard zoning code, and that's what the Carmichael Creek MPA says: is that it needs to follow the procedures of the standard zoning code. Um, so based on that, there were no conflicts. 
Um, and the zoning code outlines a process for deviations. And by the Carmichael Creek MPA referring back to the zoning code, um, it's referring and allowing um, those processes. I understand there's some confusion, and maybe that was worded a little bit um, unclear. But uh, basically, what the Carmichael Creek MPA is saying is that it needs to not change uses, so not have uh, uses outside of what would be permitted by that time zoning. Okay. So, uh, this so is like, in this, this real quick. Oh, real quick, this is Chairman Blake. Um, the protocol for our meeting, just so you know, is the planner makes their presentation and the applicant then speaks. Then we have CPAC comments. So we're kind of a little bit cart before the horse here. So I'm going to stop that right now and go ahead and we could come back to that question. But let's go ahead and let the applicant make their presentation before we do an analysis because. Uh, the CPAC can ask the questions after that, okay? Please excuse me, thank you. Okay, so let, let's go ahead and let applicants speak first before we, uh, yeah, before any anything more is said on that. So, um, so we have the applicant on the line, please. Yes, this, <clears throat> this is Gerald Jenkins, applicant for the Special Development Committee for 6815 Stanley Avenue. Yes, um, we are making application for the special development permit. This time, after going, this will be the second time. The first time, they weren't, it wasn't allowed because of its height and that it would be occupied as a accessory dwelling unit. So we went back to the drawing board we reduce the height, and we are going to only use the facility, the proposed structure for a pool house. With that being said, um, the garage, if we take the garage ceiling height of eight inches, I mean, eight feet, and then we take the joist, and then to get uh, an eight foot ceiling in the pool house, and for the architectural marriage between the existing house and this new proposed house, that is uh, it requires a minimum of 22 feet, 11 inches for the roof line. It is not it's it's not intrusive in the neighborhood to where it doesn't fit in. Um, the uh, owner <clears throat> has the support of the four. Let's see, two, four, six neighbors who could possibly see it. One's on the private lane and one's directly across the street from the house. So we ask that the committee approve this based on it cannot be seen from, from the road, from, from Stanley, Stanley Avenue. It is consistent and architecturally beautiful and matches well with the existing house. So the six people that possibly will be passing by and, and have sight of it, okay. We ask for, for the committee for the approval of this project. Okay. Um, any questions? With me. Do you have uh, anyone else that's going to speak other than yourself? Yes, we're going to have the owner speak. Okay, go ahead and well, this uh, is Josh Meyer. The CPAC will ask questions after you've concluded all of your um, applicant presentation. Okay, so go ahead and have everybody present, and then we'll ask questions after you guys are done. Okay, hey, good evening, everybody. My name is Josh Meyer, and I'm the homeowner of 6815 Stanley Avenue. So I just wanted to start by saying that um, we started this project in 2017 when we did the initial remodel on the house. And every step of the way, we tried to involve everybody in the process and hear what they have to say and let them voice their concerns. We changed the design. This is the second time that we're submitting it, and I feel like we've really um, made some serious changes. 
one of the concerns uh, the neighbors had was, um, you know, an ADU, and we're not doing an ADU. It's going to be a pool house. And the other concern was, um, you know, I didn't involve them in the process. Well, I involved them in the process, and I had uh, numerous conversations with them about it. And, um, you know, we are where we are, we are today. And, um, you know, about the height and the square footage. Um, it's architecturally pleasing to the property. You can't see it from the street. All the direct neighbors who can see it, um, I've worked it out with them, and I'm going to be doing some trees on the um, on the one side of the view six. At, uh, if you're facing the house to the immediate left, and then um, uh, the house behind me, um, owned by Maggie Ferrari, um, she's okay with it because she has a lot of foliage on her property and she can't see it anyways from the main house. And then uh, John Ballinger on the other side of the private lane, we had a discussion about my project because, you know, if you're upstairs and you're looking out the window, you could possibly see into his yard. And, um, you know, we, we, we solved that problem. And then, um, yeah, the other neighbors that are directly around me all approved the project. So I think it'll be an addition, a nice addition to the neighborhood. It'll increase property values. Um, it'll fit well on my property because my property has that split elevation. It has a raised pool patio. And then it has the lower, um, the building site. And so the only way that I can utilize that split elevation is to do some kind of a split elevation building. And um, the design committee commented on this and they were really happy with the design and they really liked it because I have such a unique space and such a unique property that that was a perfect fit for that. And, um, you know, I feel like we're going through a lot of changes to, you know, make this work. And the, um, the setback, the 12 and a half uh, setback, um, you know, it's the house is five. And so when we found that out, we have to, you know, move all the pool equipment, but I'm still going to honor that. And I didn't try to get an adjustment on that because I think that's important to people around me to have that 12 and a half foot setback. So, um, we're honoring that. And like I said, the only thing is, is we need six and a half more feet. And then the overall footprint is smaller than the 1100 feet that I'm allowed to have. So it's actually, it's, you know, less than 800 square feet footprint. And it's just going to be a little bit of height, but, um, you know, it's going to be classic cars. And, uh, I build and restore classic cars, and we have nowhere to put them. We're running out of space. So that's what the plan is here. So um, I hope everybody can get a better idea of what's going on here. And uh, thanks for letting me present uh, this information to you. Okay. Um, okay. Applicant, if that's everybody. We'll go ahead and ask uh, if the CPAC members have any questions, they can go ahead before we move to public comment. Yes, I do have a question. This is uh, Director Rockenstein uh, to the applicant. So you mentioned that this is the second time that uh, the second time process. What can you can you list and describe what was uh, the base? I was not on the board the first time, so forgive me. So what was the basis for uh, the initial uh, denial and going back to the drawing board, so to speak. If you can list those things out, and then how, and then also how you, um, how those were addressed with the neighborhood, because I'm seeing a lot of public comment either way. So I'm I'm just trying to understand the neighborhood dynamics as well. Thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm going to defer that to the homeowner. Um, here's Josh Meyer. Okay, hello, Josh Meyer again. So when we originally were going to do the building, we were going to match the house with the dormers, the front of the house, and a 30-foot um, ridge, and it was going to have the same uh, roof slope as the main house. And so um, the neighbors were concerned about that. And, and one of the biggest, the other concerns they were concerned is uh, not involving them in the process. And I've reached out to them, and I've talked to them, and I've had conversations with them about it. Well, one conversation, and uh, I was told by the individuals, uh, actually the Langs, that they were the biggest people who were opposed to this project. So he, he said that he wasn't gonna fight me. I had a conversation with him. I told him what I was doing. He asked a couple questions. I thought we were all good to go. Um, I wrote the check, here we are. And then I come to find out um, they've had a change of heart for some reason. So I have reached out to him and I had made um, changes in the uh, overall height square footage. and square footage. So And use. ADU. And use. And then also another thing is a 12 and a half foot setback. I mean, before this house has a five foot setback. Now I was told that we had to be 12 and a half feet. So we barely have enough room to get it in. 
because we're going to honor that 12 and a half foot setback to give them as much space off the private lane as um, is prescribed. So I hope that answered all your questions. Thank you for now, Ted. Okay, great. Any other questions from um, from CPAC members? Okay. Uh, well, actually, Darrell? one more question. One more question. I'm sorry. Um, okay, go to ahead. the planner um, working on this, uh, and I know I know that there was a little bit of confusion. I think in terms of what the Carmichael um, the MP the um, MPA states versus um, another the, the neighborhood association. Can you clarify that again? Uh, because there there are a number, you know, in, in viewing the the lots, there there are I, you know I know it's about the rural charm of Carmichael. I get that, um, but also in in viewing a number of the lots, they're well in ex the, some of the the actual properties are actually over in terms of the structures are over. You know, 3,500, 4,000 feet. And in one instance, it's uh, 6,800. So, um, can 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 you give us a little more? Um, you know, in order to avoid the confusion as far as the neighborhood association versus what the yeah. NPA states. Yeah, Thanks. I'd be happy to. I actually went ahead and pulled up the NPA. So, um, Section 534-13 of the NPA outlines permitted uses, and it states that those uses provided for by the underlying land use zones, um, as defined in the zoning code, be permitted and conditionally permitted the area as described in the zoning code. And then for development standards, it says the uses, conditions, and development standards applicable to the underlying zoning shall be applicable to the property described in Exhibit A, which is this uh, area. So that is what we use for um, reviewing, and that was what the, the consistency was, is it's consistent with those provisions and it's following that process. Um, so I think maybe there was confusion on us saying that it met all of the standards of the zoning code. That's why they're here and that's why they're, they're applying for the special development permit. On the other hand, you have the Carmichael Creek Neighborhood Association, which is someone we route to and they meet and uh, provide recommendations and, and input on projects as well, but it's not necessarily tied to the neighborhood preservation area ordinance. Okay, any more questions from CPAC members? This is Chairman Boyce. Okay. Um, hearing, hearing none, Darrell, do we have any uh, public comment on the line? Yes, we do. We have five members of the public waiting to make a comment. And okay. um, can you, and I'm going to have them send in the first caller. Okay. At three minutes each. At the, thanks. Thank you. Hey. Hi, caller, you have three minutes. Please begin with your public comments. Uh, my name is Jerrell Cooper. Hello, my name is Jerrell Cooper. I'm president of the Carmichael Creek Neighborhood Association. Today I'm speaking on behalf of our association. The Carmichael Creek Neighborhood Association was formed in 1985. Our association was instrumental in the adoption of the Carmichael Creek Neighborhood Preservation Area Ordinance Title V, Chapter 34, Article 1. We have approximately 130 member households. Each year, we deliver a newsletter to all households within the Carmichael Creek MPA boundaries, informing them of developments of interest in the MPA and inviting them to our well-attended annual meeting. At our annual meeting, we present speakers such as our county supervisor, representatives from the Sheriff's Department, the Carmichael Water District, the FEL Nature Center. We invite candidates for local office, such as County Supervisor and Carmichael Water District Board of Directors, to come to our regular Board of Directors meetings, which are open to all CCMA members. 
Section 534-015 of the Carmichael Creek NPA states, quote, it is in the best interest of the residents of the area described in Exhibit A in the County of Sacramento that the semi-rural residential character of the existing neighborhoods be preserved, protected, and maintained by restricting development not consistent with the existing zoning designations, end quote. Since the adoption of the Carmichael Creek MPA in 1988, no application to CPAC has been approved that does not conform to Section 534-015 of the MPA. <laughs> Approval of this permit, which is not in compliance with the existing zoning designation, would set a bad precedent for the approval of future requested permits that are not in compliance. This would further alter and diminish the semi-rural residential character of this area that is so beloved. We respectfully ask that you not approve the 6815 Stanley Avenue Pool House and Garage Special Development Permit PLNP 2021-00053. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Please send uh, the next caller. Hi, caller. You have three minutes. Go ahead with your comment. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the uh, uh, the CPAC. My name is Kenneth Hall, and I am probably most directly related caller, you to. Have three minutes. Go ahead with your comment. Most directly related to the characteristics of this project, we I'm would sorry, share. Sir. I'm sorry, sir. If you have the meeting playing in the background, can you please we mute it? Same driveway as you see in my materials. It is a very small, 12-foot rural driveway that would be shared by the three residents down at the end of that driveway, as well as the applicant. So we are direct neighbors, and we oppose uh, this project because we do not think that it meets the requirements of the current ordinance for meeting semi-residential uh, character. This project will add another 1,600 square feet on, in addition to the current approximately 3,700 square foot uh, structures that are on the property for a total of 4,700 square feet on a 0.4 acre uh, parcel. It will be almost 23 feet high, uh, which as you are aware is now as you're now aware, is more almost seven feet over the current uh, zoning requirements. It will add 325 square feet beyond that that is um, uh, authorized by current zoning issues in order to be able to add either a two or three car garage to the, the property that already has a three car garage. We cannot, um, or, or we feel strongly that it will, um, uh, that it impedes with the semi-rural residential character of our community. And if you look at that narrow driveway, you kind of see how that we live in a very rural, semi-rural kind of community. And having this additional structure will impede on that semi-rural character. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can send in the next caller. Hi, caller. You have three minutes. And if you could mute the meeting in the background, please. Hello, caller, are you there? Yes, hello. Hi, thank you, board. Uh, my name is Michael Lang, and I'm representing myself and my wife, uh, Jamie. We are the owners of 6839 Stanley Avenue, and we actually own the driveway of which Mr. Meyer has an easement off of. Um, there's two points I want to address in my Comments. One is 
I uh, pulled down Mr. Meyer's application, uh, his written application uh, dated uh, 1-30-2021, and I see two uh, misstatements or lies on the application. The first one being on the neighborhood outreach plan, where he says he showed me plans and had discussion. Um, that is not true. We've been against this project from the very beginning in 2017 for a variety of reasons, but mostly reasons that are related to access, ingress and egress out of our property. We have a small 12 foot driveway that um, we have currently three homes plus any delivery or utility vehicles that use the driveway. We're concerned that the driveway will be con constantly blocked uh, during construction and it will seriously and possibly dangerously limit um, escape from our property if need be. The second access, the second point I want to bring up is I pulled down the Sacramento Metropolitan Fire District Community Risk Reduction Division. Their letter dated February 25th, 2021. There are nine different points that required immediate action. And I don't see where any of these have been addressed. Um, point number one, show the design for a fire access roadway of not less than 20 feet of un unobstructed width. That in and of itself is impossible to meet for Mr. Meyer. Uh, as we said, it's a 12 foot driveway, oleanders on both sides. Um, if Mr. Meyer would, and Mr. Jenkins would look at the recorded easement agreement uh, between the previous owners of our property, um, and um, at that point, the Folly residence, it was termed, there is no access past his gate under any circumstances, and there is no access over the 12 feet uh, with the driveway. So I don't know how anybody can say that the fire department requirements have been met because I don't see how any of them could possibly be met. And as far as having any type of conversation with Mr. Meyer, uh, this conversation was held after the, he submitted the application that he um, has at least two mistakes on that I can see. And I said uh, at that point that I would not oppose any type of garage, single story garage. He never explained what he was building at that point or what his plans were. And I think it's... Uh, it's not in keeping with the community. The neighborhood doesn't want it. We certainly don't want it. And I would hope that you would uh, deny his uh, variance request. Thank you very much. Thank you. We can send in the next caller. Hi, caller. If you could mute the meeting in the background, you have three minutes. Caller, are you there? Oh, yes. Go ahead. Uh, my, name, my name is Sharon Dowdy, and I'm with the Carmichael Creek Neighborhood Preservation Area. And we oppose it because of the fight that the I'm sorry, I can't hear her. Well, you know what? It's because of the speaking, the, the voice isn't going at the same time I'm speaking. Ma'am, can you please mute the meeting in the background so then that way we don't have any feedback? Yeah. And, you can, and you can continue on with your public comment once you've, once you've muted the meeting in the background. <laughs> Okay, I think I, I got that. Anyway, this this plan does not meet the 
minimums that have been set up by this neighborhood preservation area for years and uh, it just exceeds uh, anything that it stands for. It doesn't represent the uh, rural neighborhood at all. That's it. Thank you. Okay. And that, um, and that concludes our public comment for item number one. Okay, so we just had four folks. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay, so at this time, uh, our procedure is to ask the applicant to address any questions brought up by the public comment, and I'll let the applicant go ahead and uh, make their rebuttal. Gerald Jenkins here. Yes, uh, as for the Hall's comments, um, he has asked me prior to this hearing to build him a garage on that private lane. So that's not consistent with what he's trying to impose on Josh. Ask Mr. Lang saying that we lied about the driveway access and the fire department rules. He should read the whole ordinance and statute set by the fire, by SAC Metro Fire. Those requirements are for a habitable house, not a pool house. And as for the Carmichael, Association, Josh was told that anything that was outside of the building code or the county zoning code, they would be opposed to. As was stated by those who complain, well, complain, but who ask for denial, that this will distract from the rural use. Let's take a look at some of the pictures and support that. This has stained, lap side, not lap siding, but uh, shingles on it. Everything's earth tone. Stone siding and is recessed. The only person who could possibly see it from their house would be Busick. And he's is in favor of the project. As for it impeding the access and egress during construction, there has, there's a uh, building project going on on the same street now by Ron and Michelle and a pool going in. And there's been multiple 20 ton trucks in and out of this lane that have not impeded or caused any problems with the access. The garbage is picked up here once a week on this street. There's another 20 ton truck. So as for it interfering, the construction interfering with access and egress is just not true. So take those things into consideration. And that's what we have to say about the comments. Hold on just a minute. Josh has one additional comment. <clears throat> Hello, everybody, again. So, yeah, my, my, you know, the issue I have is that um, it seems that when the Langs moved in, they have never gotten over the fact that they had to sign over an easement to me because I was in litigation with the previous owners of that property about my easement. And they bought the property and, and, and gave me my easement through that little lane. 
So I, I, I'm entitled to pay 20% the um, repair and redo charge when the time comes. Maintenance. And the maintenance on it. And I'm, you know, I have a right to use it. And they chime in like, you know, I'm, I'm doing something that's different than everybody else is doing. They're actually doing the same thing that I want to do. You know, and the problem that they have is the fact they haven't gotten over my easement. So those two people that are complaining can't even see my project. I only go halfway down the driveway and turn in my driveway. The people that can see my project are the Busics on the left who have given me the, that, that support my project. Maggie Ferrari in the back, she supports my project. John Ballinger directly across the lane who can see the project supports my project. And um, I just I don't understand um, how it's it's becoming such a big deal when um, I've done everything I could and reached out and tried to talk to these people and they just keep moving the goalposts. So um, I hope you guys uh, can see all that, what's really going on here, and um, we can get past all this and approve my project. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, with that, um, public comment is closed. So at this time, uh, it's time for CPAC discussion. So CPAC members, go ahead and you could ask questions of planning or the applicant um, or make your comments. This is Michael Feliciano here, um, CPAC seat number three. I'm trying to identify who are the other uh, CPAC members on in the meeting today. I'm, I'm trying to who all we have. Yeah, Jason McCoy here. I'm in the meeting. Gail, Dax, Mike Rockenstein. And then Chairman Nick Blois. Great. Thank you. I guess uh, I'll, I'll chime in first. I don't hear anybody stepping forward. I, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. I, I spoke a little bit earlier. I appreciate all the um, clarification that's been provided by um, the the um, applicant as well as the um, the planner. And I, I'm still have concerns about the um, fire access, uh, you know, it, and I, I don't claim to be um, any expert with fire code or anything like that, but, but it seems to me that, that even though the house is, it, the, uh, the pool house, it's been changed from what sounds like it was going to be a guest house with a kitchen to a pool house, that that change still features the garage, and it sounds like with some very valuable or, or some, you know, um, motorized vehicles being stored in there it seems to me like there would still be um a great importance to have um you know adequate uh fire access and so i'm just it, you know I, i'm also hearing the concerns of, of the neighborhood association and i'm hearing the concerns of the uh, the neighbors that, that do have to live back there and and move in and out and so I, I'm just, uh, I remain concerned. I'm hoping to hear from the other CPAC members if any other similar concern to this project. I, I'm just not satisfied that, that the changes that have been made to the usage of the building would, um, would fully, uh, address the, the, you know, the, the, the preservation of the, the character of the area as well as, um, the fire access concerns. Any thoughts? Uh, this is Jason McCoy. I'm, I guess I'm getting a little bit confused. Uh, David Ulrey, are you still on the line? Yes, I am. Uh, can you correct the record here? Did the depart fire department sign off on this or did they not? So the fire department initially thought that it was a um, ADU, the way they conditioned their letter. I followed up with them on that to verify uh, the uh, increased width um, requirement, and they uh, confirmed that due to it not being an ADU and not having a kitchen, that they would not require that, as it states in their letter. So um, that was late last week that they came to that conclusion. Um, 
So we don't have a formal letter from them at this point reflecting that, but that is uh, the determination that we've had from them uh, through email. Uh, this is Member Rockenstein. Wouldn't it be advantageous for us to have the formal letter in place? Oh, sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, mean I, uh, I understand. I respect an email, but I think a formal letter documenting this would be would make sense. You know, I mean, that's is that, you know we want to make sure that we're making an informed decision, and that's one of them, one of the factors involved. Thanks. Okay, this is uh, Chairman Bloys. Is there any other comment? This is Gail Dax Conroy, and I agree with Mike, the the uh, Mike Rockenstein, the, the fire in and out, uh, the protection has uh, has me a little bit concerned. And also, when the original application went in in 2017, was it supposed to be a guest house as opposed to a pool house? This is David with planning. I would defer to the applicant um, for that. That is correct. Uh, the original application in 2017 was for an accessory dwelling unit. And the concerns about the um, garage and it possibly being a fire hazard, the garage will be sprinkled. There will be fire suppression systems in the garage and in the pool house. That's by uh, present building code laws. So. Can I ask the applicant another question? And, and I don't mean to cut off. Um, I'm sorry. Who's this? Is this Michael? Yeah, yeah this is Michael. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to ask: Is, is, is the applicant is that a, is it simply a garage, or is there going to be? I mean, there was some, made some mention that that classic cars are worked on on the property is that going to be a workshop with let's say like a welding torch or arc welding or any of that stuff uh no sir so it's going to be finished classic cars and uh, i own a business in west sacramento where i build the cars it's in an industrial part of west sacramento we manufacture leaf springs for cars and trucks and we build classic cars so uh, these are finished cars that will just be driven in and out and then um, the one gentleman had, I want to answer a question. The one gentleman was asking, or the lady was asking about what we had uh, prescribed before and what changes we made. Well, we were going to do an ADU, but one of the neighbor's concerns was that they didn't want an ADU because they didn't want nobody living back there. So then we got rid of the ADU and decided to do the pool house because the pool house is all we really need. And the roof height was. And the roof height was all we needed to make that happen. So, um, and the difference between the ADU and a um, pool house is the kitchen. So when there's no kitchen, it falls into a pool house guest house, which uh, un it untriggers all the fire uh, codes that have been brought up. That's why the fire department isn't holding us to the same fire codes as the ADU would. Thank you. Yep. All right, any other questions from CPAC members? Hearing none, do we have a motion? I'm not hearing anybody step up because Member McCoy. Uh, then I'll go ahead and make the motion. I move that uh, uh, the application uh, is approved and uh, a recommend approval. Uh, through, I believe it's the zoning administrator. Okay. Do we have a second to the motion? This is Chairman Blois. I make a motion to approve. So um, at this time, Darrell, would you go ahead and call the roll? Yes, so I have a, a, a motion by Member McCoy and a second by Member Blois. So, a Member Brunette, Member Dax Conroy. Oh, uh, yes. Member Feliciano. 
Um, I, I vote, um, I don't support the motion. So that's a no? Is that correct? That's correct. correct. Okay. Member McCoy? Yes. Member Rockenstein? Yes. Aye. Member Rosales? And Member Blois? Yes. And your motion carries with Member Feliciano voting no. Thank you. Um, at this time, um, we'll go ahead and move to item number two. Darrell, would you go ahead and read the item and then planning, go ahead and uh, do your presentation. Okay, item number two is B Brothers Mini Mart Early CPAC Workshop. Okay, good evening, uh, council members. This is Chris Pahuli, principal planner. I'm filling in for Manuel Mejia this evening. Uh, the item before you is an early CPAC workshop um, for the applicant who is representing B Brothers Mini Mart uh, to get a preliminary in, or to get some preliminary input from the community and CPAC prior to uh, submitting a formal application to Sacramento County. Uh, as this is an early CPAC workshop, as a reminder, staff uh, has not completed any uh, analysis for this request. Uh, what I'm going to do is just review a very brief uh, PowerPoint uh, that contains some background information. And then um, uh, if the CPAC wishes, answer any questions prior to the applicant presenting information to you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as a reminder, uh, all of the uh, documents uh, associated with this uh, request are on uh, the um, project viewer. Uh, granted, there are not uh, many documents associated with this one. Uh, the control number, as Darrell mentioned, is PLMP 2021-49. Next slide. Uh, so the um, B Brothers Mini Mart uh, is located at 4847 Amber Lane. Um, that is north of Auburn Boulevard at College Oak Drive. It's also south of Madison Avenue. Uh, the site is uh, developed with a um, uh, multi-tenanted uh, commercial space. It is close to half an acre, zoned general commercial. Uh, the uh, the um, uh, convenience store has an existing Type 20 ABC license, which allows them to sell beer and wine. They've had that under their name since 2008. I believe the actual license goes back much further than that. Uh, they are uh, contemplating a change to a Type 21 license, which is a full uh, liquor license that will, that would allow them to sell uh, distilled spirits. Uh, this change in license from a 20 to a type 21 would require a letter of public convenience or necessity. Uh, as the site is located in a high crime area and it is also in an over concentrated census tract, there are currently four type 20 beer and wine licenses. Uh, as well as two Type 21 liquor licenses. I should note that of the four Type 20 licenses, one of them is the B Brothers Mini Mart. Next slide, please. I'm just gonna go quickly through these next uh, slides, which are just some of the exhibits that were provided uh, from the applicant team. Uh, this shows the uh, mini mart here uh, with the site plan showing the other tenants in the center. Next slide. This uh, exhibit here shows the uh, floor plan of the uh, of the mini mart and shows the shelf space and where they have um, existing uh, coolers that have uh, beer and wine. Next slide. Here are some of the uh, context photos. You have a, a really nice uh, image down on the bottom right, uh, head on looking at the uh, Mini Mart. Next slide. And then here are some uh, photos of the interior of the, of the Mini Mart. 
that concludes staff's presentation. Uh, again, I'm available for uh, questions, but as typical with an early CPAC workshop, uh, it really is an opportunity for the applicant to uh, explain their request a little bit more and get some preliminary feedback from the community and from the CPAC. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, Mr. Chairman Blois, we'd now like to hear from the applicant. So if you want to make your presentation, we appreciate that. B brother, my wife owns it, you know, and uh, I manage this uh, uh, this business and also uh, 4847 uh, Amberley in Sacramento. So uh, th uh, first of all, good evening to all the CPAC members. Uh, you know, due to the, all this um, expenses going up and uh, due to the customer demands, we uh, we like to upgrade our license uh, so you know we can uh, survive uh, survive and uh, so because everything is going up all the all the license fee rent is going up you know all every every single expense like waste mud water you know everything is going up so we just trying to survive so we can. So that's the uh, reason we like to um, add the uh, liquor, uh, liquor 21 uh, to our business, and also a lot of customer demand uh, demand for it. You know, they are asking for they they would like to have the one stop. Uh, you going, you know, once the, once they're done with the day, you know, going home, they like to do one stop, one shop stop, and uh, that's uh, pretty pretty much it. Okay, thank you. Did you have anyone else that wanted to I'm speak? I'm sorry. This is Chairman Lloyd. Did you, are, yeah. Is there anyone else on your team that wants to speak? Oh, I I didn't understand. What do you say? Is, uh, I didn't understand. What What do you say, sir? Is there anyone else with you? No, 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 sir. Okay. All right, um, Darrell, do we have any public comment on there? Yes, we do have one public comment for item number two, and okay. I will, and I will have them um, send in the caller. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, caller. Uh, you have three minutes. Go ahead with your public comment. Yes, my name is Michelle Jones, and I live in the neighborhood where B Brothers Mini Market is at. And they're trying to get a liquor license, and I wanted to show my support for that. I've been going to that store for 10 years, and it's always safe, it's always well lit. I think they should really get one. So that's my support. <laughs> Thank you. Darrell, is that all the public comments? Um, let me just double check. It looks like that may have been our last caller, but let me just double check. Okay. Oh, yes, that was our last caller. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, with that, we'll close the public comment. And um, at this time, um, you can go ahead and... Uh, to uh, um, we are just uh, making any of our comments known to the applicant. There's not going to be a vote or a motion on this, as it is just a early uh, CPAC workshop. So, um, with that, is there any CPAC members that wish to make a comment on this? This is Michael Feliciano. Go ahead, Michael. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate the information on this. Um, we're not, obviously, since we're not making a motion, but I did want to express my support uh, for granting the um, the Type 21 liquor license. I, I looked at the map, the surrounding area, and I'm actually f very familiar with the neighborhood. And my, my first initial concern was to check and see if there were any schools nearby, that kind of thing. Um, it, it looks like, it, it, it also, there's not a heavy proliferation of other liquor stores in that that uh, direct vicinity. So I feel uh, confident with uh, supporting the project when it does come back to us. If it does, 
um, but I just wanted to lend my support to it now. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Any other CPAC members? This is Gail Dax Conroy, and I have a question. Is uh, our is the uh, 21 liquor license mean? Does that mean that they will the store will be able to sell those little tiny small mini bottles, one shot kind of bottles? Yeah, that's a that's a great that's a great question. Again, this is Chris Bahuli, principal planner. Um, currently, the um, uh, currently the the uh, Sacramento County Sheriff's Department has standard conditions uh, for all um, public convenience or necessity requests, um, and those uh, standard conditions generally limit the uh, hours of operation, whether or not single. Um, uh, single containers could be sold and also limit the size of the um, of the um, uh, packaging as well. Uh, and those standard conditions generally have been upheld by the State Department of ABC. Um, and so therefore, if if um, if the request did move forward. If the uh, sheriff's standard conditions were applied by ABC, um, then they would not be able to um, sell those those small uh, container sizes. Uh, now we have been in recent conversations with ABC where there's been some um, discussion about whether or not uh, those standard conditions will be applied to every project. Uh, so that's an ongoing discussion with ABC, but at least in terms of if this project were, if they were to um, request a, a PCN, uh, we would be looking to impose, or the sheriff would be looking to impose those standard conditions on this request. I hope that answered your question. So that means generally not. Generally, generally not. Um, that we we have those conditions, and that would be our expectation that they would not be able to sell. Uh, but again, there's been some occasions where ABC has not imposed some of those conditions, and so we are are trying to make sure that they are um, going to be going to be conditioned if they do move forward. So you're trying to make sure that those the conditions not to sell the little individual liquor that, bottles. That's is correct. Part. Okay, thank you. That's correct. You. All right. Chairman, any other? Yes, Jason McCoy here. Go ahead, Jason. Um, so, um, you know, as you guys may recall, the the 7-Eleven uh, had requested this uh, in in Carmichael on Ferros Boulevard. Uh, not too long ago, and I'm not a huge proponent of, um, you know, uh, supporting requests in heavily saturated areas. However, this not being near a school, um, if there are no, uh, you know, current or recent violations on the existing liquor license, then I don't see that this would be problematic uh, to extend uh the 21 permit where there's already a successful 20 permit already in place so uh, that's my only, co only comment i have okay thank you jason um any other cpac members wish to make a comment okay hearing none um we thank the applicant and uh they'll go ahead and uh move to the next uh stage of their uh process project process Sorry, Chairperson well. Boyce, this is Darrell with the Clerk of the Board. Um, we actually did have one um, public commenter that um, that got in just before. Um, would you like to hear that public comment or would you like to continue on? Because they, they got in right when the, it was closed. Were we closed or not? It was closed. We closed it and I think that the same time we were closing it, they got into the queue. So it was kind of like a simultaneous thing. Okay, we'll give the tie to them. Let let let's go ahead and let them make their comment. But okay, I apologize for that. I'm going to go ahead and have them send in the public comment. Hey, 
and go ahead with your comment. You have three minutes. Okay. Uh, my name is Junor Singh. I'm from Sacramento, California, and I'm a, a neighbor of uh, the Bieber, the Mini Mart, and I do support them. I do want them to get the tw Type 21 liquor license. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. And that is officially the last public comment for item number two. Okay, with that, we'll close the public comment and I think uh, we can then move forward to item number three on the agenda. Yes, item number three is SB2 housing production streamlining and accelerating acceleration amendments to the general plan, zoning code, and countywide design guidelines workshop. Good evening, this is Wendy Hartman um, with the Office of Planning and Environmental Review and I'll be giving the presentation this evening. In 2019, Sacramento County received grant funding called the SB2 grant from the state of California. The goal of this funding was to encourage the development of plans to streamline multifamily housing approvals and accelerate all types of housing production. Next slide, please. Burr began this effort by reviewing our existing zoning code, general plan, and design guideline language related to housing development. Staff also received feedback provided by community stakeholder groups such as the Building Industry Association and Housing Sacramento during our housing element update process, as well as a workshop that was held with the local chapter of the American Institute of Architects, or AIA, to further inform potential amendments to our zoning codes, general plan, and design guidelines. After review and initial outreach was completed, staff has identified several key areas for amendments, which I'll go over with you tonight. Um, these include amendments to our zoning code, chapters three, five, six, and seven. So not all, but close to all of our zoning code, code chapters. Minor amendments to our general plan to ensure consistency with any zoning code changes. Amendments to our zoning code related to new state mandates around density bonus programs, along with some other modifications we need to make due to legislation and amendments to our multifamily design guidelines to comply with state regulations, which are now requiring objective design standards for multifamily residential developments, and they'll mirror proposed zoning code amendment changes. I'd like to point out for you this evening that we do not have specific language yet for each of these amendment areas, so we're still working out the actual red line strikeout changes that will occur to our zoning code and other documents. But I am hoping that after we, I give kind of a high level um, overview of some of the changes we're proposing to make to have a conversation with your CPAC about um, any thoughts you may have or specific concerns you may have about our changes. We are anticipating having a complete package of red line strikeout changes available for a planning commission workshop that is scheduled for um, hopefully late July of this year. Next slide. So the first target area I'm gonna talk about is expanding the range of housing product types allowed in some of our lower density residential zones, as well as our commercial areas. So this amendment would allow for duplexes and small multifamily projects in um, zones where they currently aren't allowed. So um, kind of our RD3 through RD10 zoning district is where we'd be looking to allow for these housing product types. I do want to point out, um, well, first, what I mean by small are projects um, with 10 or fewer lots or 10 or fewer units. So we are talking about um, small infill type development. There would be no change in the maximum density allowed in each zone district. So, for example, if you were in an RD4 zoning district and you had a 20,000 square foot or roughly half acre parcel, that parcel could currently be developed with two units. And under these new provisions, you still could only develop two, two units, but you'd have the option of creating two single family dwellings on two separate lots or a duplex on the single existing lot. So you'd still be, be restricted to the maximum density allowed per acre. Um, one of the goals of these provisions are to provide more flexibility in design and redevelopment of underutilized properties within the county and hopefully better ability for small infill developments to occur and recoup their development costs. 
So I just want to point out on this slide, um, one of our staff members does live in the Carmichael area. And I don't know what street this is on, but she took a picture of a duplex situated between two single family homes. So the house you see in the middle with the car in the driveway is actually a duplex. And so that's kind of the development we're looking for that will still kind of retain the, the current character of the neighborhood, is, but still allowing maybe for a little bit more de development um, on some of these lots, still within maximum zoning allowance. Next slide. So the next target area is um, proposing actual changes to our multifamily residential development standards. So over the last several years, we've heard from various developers that some of our development standards have been posing major barriers in being able to make a multifamily residential project work. And this is even on properties that are currently zoned for higher density development, such as RD20, where developers are struggling to meet our minimum density requirements, which is 75% of the zone maximum, and therefore can't even get close to the 20 units per acre in that type of zone district. Um, so we're looking to amend some of these more problematic development standards based on information we've received from the BIA and other developers, um, such as um, reducing some of our setback requirements, some of our open space requirements, which is the amount of common area, as well as private personal space, multifamily projects are required to have per unit. Um, some potential changes to how we look at parking or parking requirements, as well as landscaping. So for example, some of the changes could be relatively small, such as reducing the front yard setback from a minimum of 25 feet to 20 feet in some circumstances. But we also want to be very conscientious of some of our older, more developed neighborhoods and not um, negatively impacting the character of those neighborhoods. And so we're creating an, um, a definition of what we're considering an infill property which would be a property of less than two acres in size and is adjacent or immediately abutting two or more properties that are currently developed with low density residential. In those instances, we may not allow for um, more significant deviations in our standards because we wanna make sure that you're not gonna put a multi-story apartment project next to an area that's predominantly single family, single story home. So we do want to be um, considerate of the existing neighborhood character and want to make sure that when we allow for some of these lower setback requirements that we're also paying attention to the existing um, character and neighborhood. Next slide. So this um, next area is actually about creating a new entitlement process um, for requesting deviations from multifamily residential development standards. So currently, when we have an apartment complex that can't meet one of the development standards, they're required to get approval of a special development permit from our planning commission, which sometimes can be very um, expensive and time consuming when typically these types of projects would only need a design review permit. But because they need a deviation to typically setbacks, they have to go before the planning commission. The staff is pro proposing to create a minor special development permit called an SPM that could be used for a limited number of deviation requests from multifamily residential development and for deviations from certain ADU standards. We would set this process up very similar to our existing minor use permit process where the decision is made by the planning director after analysis by staff as well as a public comment period. Similar to our minor use permits, there would not be CPAC review for these SPMs, but the decisions would be appealable to the Board of Zoning Appeals and would also be subject to CEQA review. We are still working on the extent of what can be done under an SPM by either limiting the number of deviations or the percent of a deviation that can be requested before requiring the developer to go to a higher level of review, such as moving then from the administrative level to the zoning administrator or the planning commission where they currently stand, depending on the amount of deviation being requested. Uh, let's see. So I think that's it for this slide. Moving on to number six, 
is the state density bonus program, which really is more about affordable housing than density bonuses per se, as a density bonus is a benefit that they can get through this program, but they are not mandated to increase density as part of this program. So um, let's see. Um, this, so, I, so I do want to make it clear that um, in the earlier section when I talked about allowing duplexes and multi, small multifamily projects in our lower density residential neighborhoods, those could not change the density in the zoning district. Under this state program, there could potentially be increases in density, but that's not always the case. So under the most recent changes from the state, there are new project types. Historically, um, these programs were only for lower income housing developments and age restricted housing developments. The state has now added the categories for foster youth, disabled veterans, homeless persons, and college students. They have increased the maximum amount of density bonus that a developer can receive from a maximum of 35% to 80%. In order for a project to get to the 80%, it does have to be 100% affordable to lower income households. The state has also allowed for additional concessions and unlimited number of waivers to development standards, as well as decreased parking requirements for projects um, applying under the provisions of this program. As part of that, the state has changed the rental project affordability from 30 years to 50 years, 55 years. <clears throat> and it, there are also some additional modifications to our current uh, definition section in order to be consistent with state law. I do wanna stop there for just a second because I know density bonuses are an unusual um, um, program. We don't see a lot of it in the county, so I just want to make sure that, that um, all of the CPAC members understand what the state density bonus program is. I'd like to ask a question about that. Sure. And thank you for pausing here. And um, it's that was one of when I started looking at this, one of my main points of attention was to see if the provisions were being made for affordable housing. And so thank you for clarifying the language on this, the density bonus that sounds like it, it does double duty in terms of density somehow equates to affordable housing. How exactly do, is this bonus program applied? So when a project is like in, so we're, we're talking mainly about the 10 units or less type of uh, projects where this, the, um, you know, the, that this, everything we're talking about mainly covers, if I understand correctly. Can you give me an example of the type of um, dwelling that, that we would see this, uh, the, the density program applied to? So all of the other sections that I talked about on the prior slides before the density bonus were pretty much geared towards the RD7 and lower categories, and that was really about duplexes and, and small multifamily, as well as multifamily projects in our um, you know, RD15, RD20, and higher zoning designations. This program here, the state density bonus program, actually can be applied through all of our zoning designations. So there is potential for someone to come through with a single family detached or attached housing product under this project. I believe we are processing one right now at 46 and Lang, which is a combination of um, apartments as well as single family homes. Um, I have only worked on a handful of projects in my career in other jurisdictions that have used this for single family homes. They're usually, um, think of the um, sweat equity homes or the Habitat for Humanity. They will sometimes use this program um, to obtain funding or um, special concessions from um, the local jurisdiction in order to build those homes. So it could be anything from a single family residential type of development all the way to a multifamily development like you see um, on the screen before you. 
the benefit of the program to the developers is that um, you you basically get a free special development permit. So earlier this evening, you heard um, from a property owner who was wanting to deviate from development standards and, and needs to get a special development permit. Under the state density produce program, um, they can get up to four deviations to development standards depending on the percentage of units that they're making either affordable to lower incomes or are designating a certain percentage of their units to um, disabled veterans, foster youth, age-restricted units, you know, one of the target areas that they have. And they get, an, a, um, they get additional waivers. So it's like getting a free special development permit. The caveat is, is that they have to enter into a regulatory agreement with the county or an agency that the county approves, we typically use um, Sacramento Redevelopment and Housing Agency as kind of our, our housing regulator, which means um, they enter into an agreement. If it's a rental product, that product has to stay affordable or for that target group for 55 years. Um, if, if it's um, for sale product, there's some stipulations on when those properties are sold, how they have to be handled. They have to use prevailing wage. So, so there are some caveats that to, to using um, this program that sometimes make it not desirable for certain types of developers. You're not going to see this for most of your market rate type of development. It really is kind of a niche developer. Does, does that kind of answer your question? Or It did. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, if there's no other um, questions specific to what density bonus is, I'll go through the rest of my presentation and then we can always go back to any areas that your CPAC has questions on or um, areas that you want me to address further. I, I have a question. This is oh, sure. uh, Jason McCoy. So you mentioned it, uh, that there would be some kind of development agreement for <clears throat> these. A couple of questions I have is sure. uh, in the development agreement for something like this with such an increase in uh, the density, um, number one, um, is there, are there going to be provisions for the DA that uh, specify increase in bicycle storage, increase in, or, or actually provision for EV charging infrastructure for all the units? Um, you know, is there really a focus on sustainability uh, mixed in with these types of housing projects? Um, unfortunately, the answer to that is no. So the county's Chapter 6 changes, for the most part, are going to replicate the newest state standards, which is what we have historically done in the past. And the state is actually has provisions for decreased parking requirements without any requirements that there be, you know, additional bicycle parking or, like you said, EV charging or share ride or whatnot in place. Um, they, there are some provisions where they are closer to very urbanized areas that already have a good transportation system in place that could give them a, a, um, higher density increase for being close to those facilities, but there's nothing that mandates that they provide those facilities on site. Interesting. Okay. And then, um, with regard to uh, this sort of density, the number one uh, thing that we get from public comment is this is going to impact me because of the amount of traffic. Mm -hmm. Now, I do know that de decreased parking requirements, but what is coupled with this, as we saw with item number one, you have, a, you know, the state is trying to get people to put in uh, accessory dwelling units, but you've got a lot of residents that fight putting in accessory dwelling units. You've got a bunch of provisions here that are looking to increase density, uh, but you're going to have a lot of folks that are fighting against it. And the number one thing they're going to say is traffic and noise, traffic and noise. So what is coupled with these sort of development projects? Is there a, a waiver for uh, traffic standards? Uh, could you explain how that, you know, this could be successful? Uh, in light of all the public testimony that we receive on projects on a regular basis? Um, a lot of times these projects actually are processed ministerial. In other words, they are exempt from CEQA, so they are exempt from 
a lot of our traffic studies or environmental analysis. Um, many of our projects um, that we've approved in the past, um, we don't, I mean, we only get one every few years or so, um, are typically multifamily projects and therefore all they need is a non-discretionary design review along with their density bonus request. So they don't go through a SQL review or public review process. The ones that would be more likely to go through that public process and be subject to CEQA are ones where they are doing single family homes because they're creating a subdivision map. And so they do have to go through the hearing process for their subdivision map. But in many cases, um, most of your typical multifamily is not going to go through any sort of hearing process or SQL review. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions before I move on to the next slide? Uh, yes, this is Gail Dax Conroy. I have a couple of questions. Are there any developments who will buy into this or is this um, something, uh, program set up to try and attract developers who want to commit to this kind of build? Um, there are certain developers that actually specialize in certain types of affordable housing, age-restricted housing, and now I'm imagining maybe some of these other groups that are, are being added to the mix. Um, so we do have a few developers that we seem to um, hear from frequently on these types of projects. Um, Mercy Housing completed a project off of Watt where they converted the um, uh, hotel that was there right. to an affordable housing project. That would be an example. Um, Anton is um, an affordable housing builder that's done, um, I think, a handful of projects both in the unincorporated county and within the city limits of our of our sister cities. Um, so there are a handful of developers working in the Sacramento region that this is kind of their niche development style. Uh, um, one other, uh, thank you for that. And one other thing uh, being that the parking is being cut back, um, that, that says to me that these projects are really meant for um, inner city and um, areas that are, um, they're certainly not left uh, open to rural or where people have to drive places. So um, is that the push to uh, make more of these kind of projects uh, in our in the city of Sacramento and the the populated areas where they do have access to to RT as opposed to driving a car where they go and it's it seems like it's really pushing in that direction um, they definitely are able to get more a, a greater density increase as well as some other deviations when located in highly urbanized areas where there is a good public transit system but this is a statewide program. And so um, it, these types of projects can occur in the most urbanized areas, as well as very rural areas. There are examples of affordable housing density bonus programs in the Tahoe Basin. When I worked um, in Placer County, um, I worked on some in Yuba County. So they can occur in very rural areas, but you're right, it is difficult when those areas don't have a good public transit system because a lot of the folks um, living in these types of developments um, don't have their own vehicles or may only have one vehicle for an entire family. So, um, so I understand the concern, but the state um, does not have really, it, it's kind of a one size fits all state program. Okay, thank you. Can I follow up on that comment? Sure. Yeah, just to, I, the way I understand um, in infill development, and I see that, that this is, you know, geared to support um, infill type of projects, which can, you, you know, and be, we, we see um, a stronger and stronger emphasis on that, those types of projects happening in suburban regions as opposed to um urban centers and so it's kind of from what i understand especially like with the um the county in in the city the transit 
plans is that that they it's kind of a build it and they will come so that that is more of these higher density projects happen in the suburbs than that transit um um provisions could then be considered viable and then transit lines would be added and that kind of thing is it is is that is my accurate is my understanding accurate um the correct the philosophy is accurate um that is not the reason why the county is necessarily doing it the county is updating our zoning code to be consistent with state mandates but from from like a, a planning theory type question you are correct the areas that have higher density it is easier to encourage our regional transit providers to then upgrade or provide those services because they'll have the population to serve them kind of similar to um, you're not going to get retail in a greenfield area until there's a certain number of rooftops. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to slide seven. Um, so we've pretty much been talking about changes to our zoning code. This next section is going to actually make changes to the countywide design guidelines. And it's really going to be focused only on chapter three of the county wide design guidelines. And so this is where I mentioned on our first slide that the state recently made some changes requiring local jurisdictions to use objective standards rather than subjective standards when reviewing um, design of multifamily residential development. Um, so for, for example, um, we often have criteria that say compatible with surrounding area, um, which would be very subjective in nature, where if we were talking about fences, we could make that objective by saying only wrought iron fencing is going to be allowed along a street frontage. Um, so because we're also moving from an objective standard, from a design guideline standard, this chapter will also be um, renamed to um, design standards for multifamily residential projects because they're going to be treated um, very similar to the development standards in our zoning code which means currently when we have a design guideline um, there's a lot of flexibility in that guideline and how um, a, an architect or engineer can meet that that guidance but under the new provisions where we have to be more objective in order to deviate from those, they'll actually have to apply for a special development permit, similar to if they were asking to deviate from a setback standard in our zoning code. So this is another area where with the introduction of our um, SPM, our minor special development permit, could be some opportunity for some deviations in our design standards um, because we're no longer able to do them at a, an administrative level or through our design um, administrator. Um, the goal of the standards is still to balance or reduce development standards with quality compatible project design, but there are a few areas um, that are going to be added to the design standards that may be a little bit different than things that we have done in the past. And one of those areas that I want to point out is um, where we have a multifamily project that's going to be developed adjacent to an existing irre irrevocable offer of dedication or an IO IOD, um, basically a dead end street stub, we're going to require the project to incorporate that street stub into their project design to continue our circulation system. Um, it is something that has been a, a, a kind of a policy or guidance in our general plan but we haven't really been um, um, mandating that projects do this as they move forward with development. So we are looking to actually make that a requirement with the new de um, design standards for multifamily projects. Um, another area that would be a little bit more strict than what we currently have would be requiring parking lots be located at the sides and rear of apartment complexes in order to lessen visual impact as well as some restrictions on the types of walls or fencing they could have adjacent to the right of way. Um, so you can kind of see in this picture, um, the houses are fronting a street right of way. And instead of having a solid wall 
we actually have a lower fence with openings and whatnot. So it's actually creating some interaction with the street front versus just walling it off from, from, from the streets and the rest of it. Um, but for the most part, most of our changes to this chapter will really be, be changing words that are construed as subjective to having some more objective language or kind of a, a, a laundry list of things that people can incorporate into their project. So slide number eight. So this is kind of a grab bag of different state amendments that we're dealing with. Um, SB2 and AB101 were passed regarding emergency shelters. And so we need to make some minor modifications to our zoning code. Um, the first one is to allow low barrier navigation centers within our zoning code along with a definition of what those are. We've decided that we're going to lump the low barrier navigation centers in with our regular emergency shelters. So they'll pretty much only be allowed right now in our general commercial and light industrial zone districts where emergency shelters are currently allowed. And a low barrier navigation center um, is one that doesn't necessarily restrict um, homeless folks from using the services if they are struggling with alcohol or drug addiction or if they have pets or mental health issues. So it's really about trying to get them off the streets first and then deal with some of the issues that, that they also may be going, going through is the purpose of the Low Barrier Navigation Center. We also need to add a definition to our zoning code for supportive housing. We currently mention supportive housing um, primarily as a type of residential care home, but permanent supportive housing can also be um, built and designed um, just like any other multifamily residential project as well as other types of single family residential development. So we'll be making it clear that we'll be treating supportive housing in the same manner as the most similar use that it's operating at. And then the last area of modifications are really more about internal procedures and processes such as our application forms and user guide as well as our website to better address SB 35 and SB 330 um, you might have heard about some of these when we made some modifications to our CPAC ordinance this past year, where there were limitations on the number of hearings we can have for housing development projects, as well as the level of review that we can put these types of projects through. Um, so that kind of rounds out all the different changes that we're looking at. Um, I'll just go through our next steps and then hopefully can have a little bit of a conversation um, with all the CPAC members on any input you may have. So let's see, slide nine. Thank you. Um, so we are holding workshops with each of the 14 CPACs. Um, we started um, the, the presentations two weeks ago, so we're not quite to the halfway mark yet, probably about a third of the way through. We are hoping to have uh, meetings with all the CPACs completed by June, at which point staff will finalize the draft amendments to the zoning code, general plan, and countywide design guidelines, and then we'll present them to a work in a, present them to the planning commission in a workshop format. All of the CPACs will be notified of this workshop in case you want to participate. We don't have an exact date yet, but we are targeting um, very end of July for that. And then um, once we get comments from the commission and public at that workshop, we will uh, finalize comments and the documents and bring them to public hearing before the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors um, late fall, December of this year. So we do um, have a website um, under what's new on the Planning Department page. We do have a link for SB2 for this project, the SB2 Housing production streamlining and acceleration project link. So as we have new information available, we will be posting information to our What's New page. Um, Jessica Brandt is actually the lead planner on this project, but um, myself and another staff person are taking turns presenting to the various CPAC committees. So if you do have questions um, after this meeting, 
feel free to follow up by sending your sending your email or comments to Jessica Boyan. All right, so with that, I would be happy to answer any additional questions um, the CPAC may have or areas that you may be concerned about that you'd like us to make sure that we pay particular attention to as we're making changes to our multifamily development and design guidelines. Yeah, this is uh, Chairman Boyce. Um, but I just reiterating some of the other concerns, I think the number one thing I see here is as Jason had mentioned, is gonna be traffic patterns and parking. I mean, if they're gonna to try to put a 20 unit complex with only 20 parking spots, that's, I mean, that would be a minimum, but I, it's mm -hmm. just, those are some of the concerns out in the suburbs like Carmichael and Old Foothill Farms, that has been a major obstacle in some of these projects is the number of parking places, especially when you have a highly dense, like you have a court where there's no flow through parking. I don't know if there's any consideration that y'all can make for something like that. That's a good comment, anyone else? Yeah, I, I wanted to circle back around to the um, the, uh, the item that that was focused on. Um, and it, I don't see the slide in front of me, so I'm going to get it as, as close as I can. Navigation centers and mm -hmm. talked about um, projects that they were focused on low barrier housing. And and um, I'm I'm a, previously a mental health professional, so I'm very with the focus on this area right now with the you know um housing first type of initiatives and in, in that kind of thing and i wonder if, what type if you can clarify again what type of amendments to the, the language were being made to um is it made to to facilitate more of those types of projects to make them easier to gain approval for and, and um, is is that is that what we're talking about? Um, the the short and long answer is yes and no. So with this first grant, all we are going to be doing is adding in that you can have a low barrier navigation center in the same zone districts that we allow our more traditional emergency shelters. So right now, emergency shelters in the county, in the unincorporated county, are only permitted in our general commercial and our light industrial zone district. So with this right. particular grant, it would just be opening up low barrier navigation centers in those two zone districts. Um, we do have another grant that we just recently received funding for, and we will be looking at our um, overall kind of group home supportive living and emergency shelter provisions in more detail as part of that grant to meet some of our housing element mandates but at this point in time it is very limited in just allowing them in those two zone districts thank you for that clarification and, and mm -hmm. i know that that's that's one of the the uh, big barriers that the state housing initiatives are run up against at the community level is that there's, you, you know, they, in just having options in, in terms of places to place these types of programs. And so um, it, it'd be interesting to see where we move from that because, the, the, you know, have the limited zoning that you're talking about is fine, but you kind of run out of, at some point, you, you run out of options, right? Correct. And our actual housing element has a program, um, which is, a, I believe, a new state requirement that we're going to have to analyze the zone districts where our emergency shelters and low barrier navigation centers are permitted. And is it adequate to address um, the need for our homeless population? And um, chances are, just because it is so limited to just those zone districts, the answer will be no, which means with our next grant, we will be needing to look at other zone districts that will allow for some of these services and, and facilities to occur. 
And when we get to that point, we'll be back in front of all the CPACs again, um, kind of doing a presentation that may be more focused on, on you know, certain, certain types of abuses such as those. Thank you for that. This is Gail again. Uh, I, uh, a couple of comments I think are really, really important when you actually put all this down in writing. And that is um, the, the parking, the parking um, is not just based on the individual who lives in affordable housing, be it foster youth or disabled or vets. But the people that provide services to them, the social workers, the, um, the families, the uh, caregivers, they, uh, they all drive cars and they need places, as well as those people who are fortunate enough to live there because it's affordable, but happen to have a car to drive to their jobs. Though, all of those people who need to gather at that facility for some reason, will be parking on side streets, clogging up neighborhoods, because there is not parking available for people to go and see their clients. So I just think that's very important. There's a cycle that can start here that will make neighborhoods who are generally friendly to these kind of developments or could be friendly realize they made a mistake because now they can't park in front of their own houses and there's nowhere for people who are visiting the people in these homes or apartments to park. So that's just my comment. I hope somebody thinks about that while they're considering cutting back parking in these multi-family units. So that is something we definitely can consider for the market rate projects that are not applying through the state program. We have a lot more ability over what our current land, land use controls will be or not be. But if someone does apply under the state density bonus program, we actually are limited in the amount of parking we can require per those state guidelines. So while I don't disagree with you that, that it's a concern and it seems like a lot of these um, state changes are really um, designed for more urban environments but are applied uniformly across our state. There will be some limitations in areas where we can mandate more, more parking depending on which program the developer is going through. It's just hard to believe that intelligent people can put together these programs to offer statewide and not think beyond a half or a half parking. Anyway, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I understand your frustration, yes. <laughs> Any other questions from CPAC members? Okay, hear, hearing none. Um, well, thank you for your presentation. We appreciate that. And um, just remember, parking is an issue for us. Definitely. Thank you very much. Thank you. And this okay. is Darrell with the Clerk of the Board, and I just wanted to let you know that there were no public comments for item number three. Okay. Um, okay, now we'll move to item four, staff update. I don't see that Chris Pahuli is still on the line. So as the principal, I am not aware of any staff updates. Um, David, did he provide you with any announcements? Uh, no, there are no other announcements that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, thank you. All right. Um, council member comments? CPAC members? Any general comments? None from me. None from <laughs> me. Okay. okay. All right. None from um, me. Thank you. Uh, Darrell, are there any public comments floating out there on something other than what we've done, item one through three? No, there are no additional public comments for item number six any or any off-agenda comments. Okay. All right. Um,
So with that, um, our protocol has been that we just adjourn. So um, Darrell, unless I'm missing something, we're adjourned. No, that's correct. Okay. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. Everybody. Good night. You're welcome. You guys have a nice evening. Good night. Thank you. Good to meet all of you. You too. Take care. Bye-bye.